you on your end. Please, can you give me an indication on the chat box if you can hear me clearly? Yes, perfect. Uh, my name is Tanusha Singh and I am leading the NIOH, Occupational Health Outbreak Response Team. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, training session on behalf of the National Health Laboratory Services and the National Institute for Occupational Health. And I'd like to also extend a warm welcome to our special guest, um, Mr. Hilton uh, Ganesan from the Department of Employment and Labor, as well as Ms. Natasha van der Berg from the Construction Council. And they will be speaking uh, a little bit later in the program. The NIOH has been conducting a series of training sessions related to COVID to a number of occupational groups and industries, and today marks our 26th session. And we are very pleased to be conducting the session on COVID-19 and return to work in the construction industry. And it is uh, wonderful to be engaging with you and the Institute looks forward to future collaborations as we strive towards healthy, safe, and sustainable workplaces during this challenging period. We endeavor to make all our training accessible to as many people as possible, and hence all our sessions are recorded. The presentations will be sent to all participants on email, and they are also available on our website. And uh, on the website, you will also find a recording of the session, as well as uh, posters and fact sheets relevant to various industries, which are welcome to um, download and uh, distribute to within your networks. Uh, our uh, website is also zero rated by nine major service providers in South Africa, and you will find the listing on the website. Um, with that, I would like to thank you for joining the session and thank the entire uh, NIOH team involved in organizing the session. And I wish you a very productive session. I would like to hand over to our program director, Mr. Ashraf Raikliff, which will, will take you through the uh, program, as well as a few virtual housekeeping rules. Thank you. Thank you, Tanisha. And uh, that welcome was by Dr. Tanusha Singh, who's also the head of our immunology and uh, microbiology section here at the National Institute for Occupational Health. So I'm Ashraf Raikliff, I'm the National Occupational Safety Training Manager, and welcome, as Tanusha indicated, to this uh, uh, session. That's the uh, second dozen, more than two dozen sessions we've had. And this one focuses particularly on the uh, practitioners and those responsible for COVID-19 workplace response of uh, preparedness and workplace prevention uh, in the construction sector. Um, I do understand that there's a, a multitude of people from engineering to co construction health and safety agents, construction health and safety managers, and construction health and safety officers, and others who are responsible for health and safety in this particular section. So welcome to that. Um, a, a few quick house rules, please. Um, we have a license of up to a thousand people. We do know that more than a thousand people have registered for the session, and they will all be joining us as uh, we, we go along. Um, but a few quick house rules. Um, if you uh, do not manage, if any of your colleagues don't manage to get on, we can encourage them to also look at YouTube. Uh, it is being um, streamed live on the NIOH uh, South Africa YouTube channel. And uh, for all your questions, um, that's a sense uh, of the YouTube channel. And you can see there at the top is the link. I'm going to ask Glenn just to copy that link and post that link in the chat box. Um, and then please just share that link with your colleagues who do not manage to get into the Zoom session when we reach the maximum of 1,000 for uh, this platform. Um, now, you'll see that Glenn is using the chat box, and I think I'm pointing at it. And that chat box is for comments, please, comments. At the bottom, you will see that there is a Q&A bubble. I think I'm pointing at it now, somewhere over there, right? When you use the Q&A, that's where you type your questions and our presenters can also answer some of those questions as we proceed whilst we are live. 
So only restrict yourself to asking questions in this Q&A box here at the bottom. Do not use the chat box that's below here uh, where John has said something. So um, and in the chat box, that's for comments and for anything else that you want to say. So having said that, um, let me introduce you to the program. Um, Dr. Tanusha uh, Singh has already indicated that all of our resources you find on our website it is zero rated and you find video recordings, audio recordings of previous sessions, including this session will be on the website, as well as all the other resources, posters, information sheets, um, you know, uh, what is it called, uh, those, uh, the little info infographics that we use. And we also find some of our videos and infographics on our uh, Twitter channel, which is also indicated on our website. For the program, to move on, we have invited uh, the registrar of the SACPCMP, um, uh, 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 and unfortunately, Mr. Matutle is uh, was available until this morning and has uh, asked his colleague uh, Natasha van der Berg to uh, give a short introduction to this particular program. Thereafter, we have Dr. Pumi Ndaba, Dr. Ted Volmik, and Mr. Hilton Ganesan for the rest of the program. Natasha, are you online? And are you unmuted? Good morning. Good morning, Natasha. Welcome. Uh, I'm welcoming Natasha van der Berg on behalf of the SCCP CMP. And Natasha, just help me out. The long abbreviation, I always get it wrong. Can you just tell us SCCP CMP? Yes. Um, this stands for the South African Council for the Project and Construction Management Professions. Thank you very much. So welcome, Natasha, on behalf of the SACCMP, and uh, we have a few minutes for your introductory remarks on behalf of your registrar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashraf. Good morning to all who join us via the web, and thank you to the National Institute for Occupational Health um, for hosting this webinar today. My name is Natasha van der Berg, and I'm representing the South African Council. for TMP for those who have time constraints. We find ourselves in interesting times. The world is changing at a rapid rate and the way we interact with each other in business and our personal lives and in society has had to be reviewed. Not simply to improve but to survive. The South African Council for the Project and Construction Management Professions has not been a stranger to change over the years. As a regulatory authority in South Africa, the council was initially established in terms of section 181C of the Project and Construction Management Professions Act to certify, register and regulate the project and construction management professions. This ambit later developed to encompass uh, construction health and safety. And this is a sector that has developed in leaps and bounds over the past years. Even more so in the past few months as the COVID pandemic swept across countless nations. Could it ever be anticipated that a virus would cause such widespread fear and change to our society norms in such a short amount of time? Now this pandemic has forced us to relook at all of our safety related protocols and procedures to ensure a maximum containment of the virus. The SACP um, CMP has worked closely with entities such as the Department of Employment and Labor, and representatives of the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure to manage the new normal that we are going to face going forward. Today's interaction with um, NIOH, our host and the present, uh, presenter of this webinar is another example of how entities in South Africa have come together to guide professionals as they return to their new normal and how they must be COVID aware. We applaud these efforts and the industry leaders that have worked together for these return to work procedures for their peers and for their lives. We look to them for such guidance. We look forward to this forum empowering the candidates and professionals of the construction industry to manage their new normal. We are certain that the guidelines for COVID that will be discussed today will create great, um, will create good discussion and facilities and, sorry, I beg your pardon, and facilitate creative um, risk management in this collaborative forum. But to move forward, we must stand together, and it must be noted that without the collective support of all industries, we will find ourselves failing. 
I'm confident that this can be achieved and we will not fail and we will find success. NFL coach Vince Lombardi once said, the price of success is hard work, the dedication to the job at hand and determination of whether we win or lose. We have applied ourselves to the best, uh, applied the best of ourselves to the task at hand. So let us all apply ourselves here to this task and move forward for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Natasha van der Berg on behalf of the SSCCMP. And uh, we thank you for uh, her doing that on behalf of the registrar of the SSCCMP. Um, so the, the balance of the program, as you've seen in the invite and the program sent to you, one, um, the uh, next speaker is from our occupational medicine section. Uh, that is uh, Dr. Mpumi Indaba, and she's going to address the COVID-19 update and construction work, uh, that is workplace preparedness specifically. And that is followed by her colleague in the occupational medicine section, Dr. Odette Volming, and she will deal with the return to work procedures and workplace preparedness policies, etc. And then our final speaker before our Q&A is Mr. Hilton Ganeshan. He's from the Department of Employment and Labor, and he's going to deal with construction sector guidelines for COVID-19. I hand over to Dr. Ndaba. Thank you, Mpum. Thank you, Ashraf. Good morning, colleagues. My name is Mpumenda, but as Ashraf has mentioned, I'm going to be uh, discussing briefly workplace preparedness, uh, forecasting, and construction work. The NIH is part of the NHLS, the National Health Laboratory Service, which is the largest diagnostic pathology. Apologize for that. Our camera just reset on, on its own, and we're going to ask uh, Dr. Lava just to start with these slides again. Thank you. Colleagues, sorry about that. I'm going to be doing a presentation on workplace preparedness, focusing in uh, construction work. And now, H is part of the NHLS, the National Health Laboratory Service, which is the largest diagnostic pathology service in South Africa. We provide lab and, and public health related services to more than 80% of the South African population. We support national and provincial departments, and the NHLS has at least 7, 000, more than 7,000 uh, employees and 356 laboratories across 260 sites in all nine provinces. The NIOH, uh, which is part of the NHLS, is the National Institute for Occupational Health. We provide specialized services in occupational health, ranging from teaching and training, knowledge generation, advisory service, including but not limited to outbreak response, um, uh, public health, and, and occupational health services. We get most of the information that we use from reliable sources, and it's also important that colleagues try and, and know these uh, sources as uh, reliable resources for getting information and up-to-date information on the disease. And on a global level, where we stand with COVID-19, we are above uh, 6.5, we have above 6.5 um, infections globally, and there have been at least uh, 388,000 deaths as at the, um, today. South African picture is at last night. Uh, the Western Cape had more, more than 24,000 infections, uh, followed by the Eastern Cape and Gauteng. Is it last night? I think the report was that Eastern Cape was then number two and Gauteng number three. In South African uh, perspective COVID related to COVID-19, we know there was a lockdown in March. And also after the lockdown was uplifted on the 30th of April, and we move from level five, level four, we are currently at level three. Initially, we started as a country with travel-related 
uh, acquired spread and then we moved on to community acquired spread when the uh, travel was banned, international travel and even between provinces initially that was banned. Occupational cases that we've heard of currently have been mainly on health workers where we know they've been investigated and confirmed as, as such. But a number of workplaces have also related, have, have reported travel-related um, infections and, and being travel-related workplaces, teachers, health workers, retail workers, correctional services, and mining. As at level four, it was expected that, or it was estimated that about 60% of construction work was res resumed. And now we're at level three, it's expected that about 100% of construction work uh, will be resumed. And it's important to remember why we mentioned all the other places that construction work interf interfaces with all other industries and workplaces. So it's also important that we keep tab on what's happening on other workplaces and industries. A little bit of recap on the microbiology of the virus. The, the current uh, coronavirus is a, is a member of the coronaviruses which are responsible for common cold and usually so cause self-limiting upper respiratory tract infection. It's known as the novel coronavirus, novel meaning it's new, it's unknown, and we don't have immunity to it because our bodies have never been exposed to that. The transmission of the virus, it's through direct contact, which is through touching an ill person or contaminated surface, droplet transmission, where you inhale droplets from a person who was maybe coughing or sneezing, where different droplets are generated in different sizes, and larger droplets fall to the ground within one to two meter radius of the person within a few seconds. And then we know that uh, people are more infectious when they are symptomatic. The prevention practices in the workplace and, and even, uh, even at home include practicing good hand and, and respiratory hygiene, avoiding close contact with people who are coughing, staying at home if people are ill, wiping down all surfaces with disinfectant. It's important that you remember all these prevention uh, practices because not only are they for hospital or specialized areas, they are for everywhere as part of preventing the infection. And we take these prevention practices along into the workplace and move around them or look around them, how we can ensure that these practices are practiced in the workplace. So some of the symptoms, uh, there's, there's a number of symptoms for COVID-19. COVID-19 is a disease that you get from acquiring uh, from being infected by the, uh, the coronavirus, um, uh, the coronavirus. So the symptoms may include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And there's a concept of person under investigation. So any person with acute respiratory illness with sudden onset of at least one of the following, it could be a cough, it could be a sore throat, shortness of breath, or a fever of more than 38 degrees is, is referred to as a person under investigation. Until recently, these people would have had if anyone has these symptoms, they would uh, definitely be referred. When they show up at the hospital or health center, they'd have to be tested for um, COVID-19. So people who do get disease from what we know or from what has been reported is that 80% of the people who get disease have mild to moderate disease, common flu-like or cold, and 15% of, of, of people who get disease uh, require hospital admis admission, and 5% of the cases become critically ill and require ICU, of which 2% will die. And of importance that people with underlying comorbid or comorbidities, especially pulmonary disease, the elderly, the immunocompromised, are uh, at increased risk of uh, the worst outcomes for the condition, for the disease once they acquire that. So this also speaks to our, our policies in the workplace where we look at trying to identify these people who are at risk, but also ensuring that there's optimal protection um, throughout people in the workplace, but also these people should be identified and should be pro protected as if they, are, if they get disease, their outcome is likely to be um, not, um, not, not as good or you know, as, as predictable as the other people who do not have comorbid uh, illnesses. Isolation and quarantine, just a little bit on that. Quarantine refers to when we separate an asymptomatic person for a period longer than the incubation period of the disease. In this instance, it's, it's normally 14 days. And isolation refers to where somebody now is um, symptomatic with their condition and then you ensure that, to ensure that the disease is not spread, then that person is in, is in isolation. 
There's no treatment currently and there's no vaccine for COVID-19. The only available management or somehow treatment is more supportive therapy and monitoring, which means it's not a specific uh, treatment modality for COVID-19, but you just treat the symptoms as they appear. In terms of uh, uh, persistence of the virus, the virus has a, is, is a fragile virus sensitive to most uh, common disinfectants. And the survival time in the environment depends on a number of factors, the pH, which you know as how acidic the environment is, the, the inoculum size, let's say somebody is coughing, how, how, how big the size of that inoculum, and the, in that inoculum, sorry, and then dryness of the surface or the area, temperature, and then exposure to disinfectant, and then the type of surface. The diagram below shows the different surfaces on which the virus might land on and how long it's likely to last if the surface is not cleaned. Very important to remember, if the surface is not cleaned with a disinfectant, the virus might last there for those days. So some of the potential sources of exposure in the workplace could be community acquired. This is somebody who might have acquired the virus uh, through the community transmission or out of the workplace. But remember that as that person comes to the workplace, there could also be also a workplace acquired. Some, they could be in touch with somebody if the, the, the right processes are not followed, if the social distancing is not maintained, um, somebody else might acquire that disease uh, in the workplace. And then also, as people are returning to work, we know that uh, especially most industries had closed, construction industry, some would have opened for the first time now in June. So some people are coming to the workplace post lockdown, some people are coming from, they might have had quarantine while they were at home, and some people might have been on isolation, which means they were not well, they tested, and then they were isolated from home, and then they're coming back to the workplace. And some people might have been coincidentally on sick leave, other sick leave, and other maybe annual leave or so. But all of these people and all the other people are coming back into the workplace. So what practices should we be getting ready for and how should the workplace be ready for such people? So there's a risk and, 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 and for, for, for employees as they come back. And these are the issues that need to be addressed. The primary risk, as I mentioned before, is people have a risk of acquiring this infection from the workplace. And also another risk might be they might be transmitting to other colleagues in the workplace. There's also the financial risk in terms of the sick leave. What happens to somebody with no sick leave or no leave and yes, they, yet they get sick? And also there might be no, there's no medical aid cover. Other people are not really um, having access to medical aid. So in terms of having to access the public health services, if you think of the time spent there, so it might not be as easy as taking an hour to go consult and so forth. And the other important issue, especially for the construction sector, is traveling to different areas and with no access to healthcare facilities, maybe because people are not aware where these services are and they might not be aware what to do because it might be an area which they are not familiar with. And another problem or another risk for the workplace is asymptomatic workers who are likely to transmit to others. As we said, some people don't become asymptomatic even though they have the disease. Mental health issues in terms of psychological and psychiatric disorders, uh, there have been reports of some of these psychiatric disorders have worsened. But overall, psychologically, most of us have been anxious around this time because of the issues that I, I've mentioned above, you know, the risk of transmission, and if the workplace is better prepared to deal with people as they come back. And there are also issues of rehabilitation and accommodation of employees as they come back, be it they have, might have had infection or maybe they might have been contact and now they come back to the workplace. So there's a big, big issue of what can they do? Are they going to be fit for work and so forth? If you consider the construction uh, environment, we know the issue of when a person has not been uh, working or has not been around for a certain time, there's an issue of the construction medical. What's going to happen then? Is this person going to be fit? What happens to their fitness card? So, some of the workers were at risk of infection. Maybe just to start by, by, by saying every person may be at risk of exposure. However, the risk is higher for those interacting with other people. So if we think of our construction work, we know that there's also a lot of interaction amongst workers and also between workers and members of the public or people that uh, where construction might be happening, people around there. 
But immunocompromised workers, as we said, are at high risk of infection. So in our workplaces, people with pre-existing conditions as listed there, be it asthma, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, kidney failure, and any other immunocompromising condition as advised by the attending health care provider. Those people are at high risk, as I explained before. So they need to be considered and, and taken care of accordingly. So uh, in terms of the occupational risk, uh, some of the occupational uh, uh, risk factors or people, occupations at risk include the list um, as it appears there, the airline, people in airline operations, border control, healthcare, etc. But also other categories, as we said, people interacting with people, teaching staff, cleaners, maintenance staff, and construction workers. I've highlighted construction workers because in all these workplaces, now and again, there's, there's likely that maybe there's maintenance or some construction that might take place. So that takes away your usual risk assessment that you have done in your usual workplace but it means you need to be aware of the risk in that new area where you're going to be working in. So we know about the, the risk assessment as it's in, in mentioned in the construction regulations, but of high, to highlight at this time, this is the time when all risk assessments will have to be updated to accommodate the risk, and expo the risk of exposure to COVID-19 and to identify who might be at risk through which processes and so forth. And it's very important to remember that we can do a risk assessment for an area, but different workers have different risk exposures based on job-specific risk assessment, but also their pre-existing conditions, as we said, vulnerable workers and all of that. And also people are working away from home. I mentioned before, they might not be familiar with the new work environment and in terms of access to facilities and also fear of job loss and employment uncertainty. So those are our other psychological issues that need to be tackled and need to be brought up in our different risk assessments. How the risk is mitigated uh, in the workplace is through several means. Initially, we talk of primary prevention where we minimize the risk of transmission in the workplace through the health risk assessment and controls. So we need to have controls in place. Uh, could be engineering controls, administrative and PPE, um, but also thinking of business continuity and how in that business continuity we, we, we have policies that, that tackle or that talk to pandemic preparedness in the workplace. There has to be also emphasis on education and training or health promotion. We know that education and training is supposed to happen in the workplace for most of the workplace hazards probably it has been happening, but at this time there has to be education and training specific to COVID-19 but also health promotion to tackle different diseases. As we said, the vulnerable workers, people need to know how their different conditions uh, will affect them and if they are managed and what should they do to ensure that their conditions are optimally managed. There's also secondary prevention where uh, th this serves to identify people at risk and also respond early to people who've been affected or people who've been contacted and also tertiary prevention, as I mentioned before, rehabilitation, and workplace um, reaccommodation. My colleague, uh, Dr. Odette, is going to be talking to the secondary prevention aspect, but maybe a little bit as well on tertiary prevention. So some of the workplace changes that need to be considered include some of the engineering controls. These could be improved ventilation. However, some of most or some of construction work take, takes place in a natural or mechanical ventilation but also for those you might need now to ensure that there's optimal administrative controls in the form of su and, and substitution where relevant and then PPE. Some of the administrative controls, just to highlight a few, I know my colleague is going to go in detail on, on them, include social distancing and some of the office-based workers. We need to look at the office space as well and then people working off-site, if we possible, People should be encouraged to be working off-site, especially for the office-based workers. But also, this is the time that we also need to look at the workplace facilities. For example, ablution facilities, restrooms, dining facilities, lodging areas, and even though travel at this stage is still domestic, but we need to look into those issues of where the different workers in construction go to stay. And in, in, on those areas is the optimal hygiene control and also social distancing. It's important that if, if there was no practice or no policies on time and attendance, this is the time that it's very important because workers 
might convene in one area to start in, but wherever they end up, it's very important to know who was at work on that day, how many were there, for the benefits of time, primarily prevention, but also later on for the benefits of contact tracing to ensure you know, should there be an incident in an area, how many people might have been potentially exposed in that area, rather than subjecting everyone to uh, sort of disrupting the, the, the business um, services or continuity. Also important that we educate and inform uh, all the workers. I know in construction, a lot of people uh, work in different sites, but we need to ensure that we have communication platforms that are accessible to all workers. And then also we need to provide relevant and credible information around COVID-19. For example, in terms of traveling, where people travel to different areas, could even be domestic travel, but we need to know where, wherever people are going. What preparedness measures is the business going to provide for those, especially if you're traveling to hotspots, there's some construction that needs to take place there. What are the policies regarding sick leave? And what should happen when somebody has to stay away? Because people have to be allowed, especially around this time, to stay away for flu-like um, symptoms and illnesses so that they, are, they go to the respective uh, workplace, uh, health centers for further investigation. And also, as I said, it should be made possible to work from home. But also a word of caution for people who are also traveling around. It is also be nice for the employer, it's advisable that the employer tries and identify as part of the communication, also to advise the employees, where are the areas that they could go to for, to access health services or health care. Some of the means that need to be looked into as part of minimizing risk of transmission in the workplace include uh, as people are coming back to the workplace, there has to be screening processes and identification of potentially affected people where also limit contact and movement. Social distancing is very important. I know there's a lot of sharing of tools, uh, common places in, in, in construction. You might need to look into that. How many people have access to what? And also the tools that people are sharing. How are people going to go around that? And one of the issues that, um, that what could happen also is the hygiene practices in terms of using the sanitizers where possible, but also ensure that there's available water and soap for washing regularly. And then employees need to be advised that they need to avoid touching their face, especially while working. And it cannot be overemphasized that people who are symptomatic need to stay away or self-isolate. However, the business needs to ensure that they encourage that but I, by advising people of what will happen should they stay away so that people don't come to work with symptoms as, as they are scared that they might not get paid or they might be fired and, and, and so forth. So some of the workplace preparedness means include people need to know the anticipated number of staff. So we need to plan ahead. How many people are we expecting where? As, as services are opening up or have opened up, we need to also think of construction or construction related activities that need to take place in public spaces where it's a workplace with no physical boundaries and it's actually a temporary workplace. What should workers do when they go to those areas? And also a risk assessment that will look at potential risk, potential increased risk of transmission in different operations and activities. So the COVID-19 exposure control plan suggests that this, the, um, these are some of the areas that might need to be highlighted or looked at. We, need, we might need to designate a site-specific COVID-19 office site every job site, and also plan for office staff to have, you know, ability to work from home. And when that office staff is working from home, who's going to provide that service, be it communication or some other means of, let's say, distribution of whatever needs to be distributed from the office. Training of all staff in terms of what should happen when, you know, for example, when there's somebody who has been found or confirmed to have, to have COVID-19, how should people protect themselves? Also, the identification of highly touched areas, the tools, the screws, the crew vehicles, etc. you know, and also screening, you know, where workers should be asked to identify themselves where possible and should be taught what symptoms to look for. And also the workplace or the business should be able to screen all workers, one as they come back, but also on frequent basis to ensure that the workplace, as people come to the workplace, there is reduced risk of transmission to other people where possible. And also there has to be an emphasis of a plan for affected workers. 
and also social distancing in the workplace. But of utmost importance is that when people are going to work in high risk areas, for example, people are going to do some construction work in the hospital or in a retail center, what should happen? So it might not necessarily be the usual PPE that you use in another site, but look at sort of a refreshed risk assessment and how you communicate risk with that area where people might be going to. With an, with an emphasis of how you protect the employees or the construction workers that are coming to that site. So some of the workplace practices to review in construction, transportation, teams, how teams are transported, that should adhere to the transportation guidelines which um, have been uh, published and changed in, 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 the transport, in the transport ministry. But also transportation, we know a lot of construction um, teams usually transported in vans and you know, a, a big crowd using smaller vehicles. That needs to be looked at because remember, we're trying to deep out and minimize mass gatherings. So also look at the areas where people are going to eat, the rest facilities, the common areas. These are the highlights. These are the areas that are under normal circumstances are likely to be gathering areas where masses are, you know, are, are likely to, to, to be gathered. So the waiting areas as well, we know people have been asking the construction regulation, say we need to have medicals as we come back. What should happen with the medicals? What should happen with the clinic? processes, what processes should be done and so forth, rather than people going to convene in a clinic area or maybe be sent somewhere to have medical, something needs to happen within the industry to decide on the way forward or even staggering people if they need to go for those medicals. I'm mentioning this taking into uh, consideration that there have been specific recommendations on other parts of the medicals, for example, spirometry, what should happen. But when it comes to audiometry, as people have been asking and other processes, it's very important that you look at each process, even within the clinic facility. Is there going to be sharing of uh, facilities? Is there going to be sharing of space? Is it safe? Is it not safe? Rather than just thinking because there's no statement on the other procedures, people can continue. And also looking at the meetings and forum, you know, the toolbox talks, they, they still need to happen, but how do they happen? And then health and safety risk, uh, risk and systems review, as I mentioned, the spirometry, the breathalyzers, if they were taking place, how better could that be done, you know, in terms of not actually minimizing, um, you know, the controls, but ensuring that we don't, we don't try to enforce controls while we're exposing people to uh, COVID-19 during this time. I've mentioned the issue of time in attendance and public spaces and workers, because it's very difficult to control the public, whereas the workers will be in a controlled uh, environment because they're at work. So what do you do in that, in that uh, environment? This, is, should be, this should be part of the plan and things that you need to consider in your plan. That should be all for myself. So my colleague Odette is going to start on, uh, to take over and talk on return to work procedures, the specific procedures that need to be highlighted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mkume. And we hand over to Odette, Dr. Odette Volnik. Um, and whilst we're waiting for the presentation to be placed on the screen, I must remind you to please type your questions in the Q&A box and uh, do not type your questions in the chat box. Uh, we do have all of our presentations and videos on our website. It is zero rated. I hand over to my colleague, Dr. Dr. Odette Volnik. Thank you, Odette. Hello colleagues and thank you so much for this opportunity to speak around how the construction sector can prepare itself for, um, for dealing with COVID-19 as, as, it, as it enters uh, our workplace. So our, our, my colleague Mpumi before me spoke to a little bit to the hierarchy of controls and this is as usually followed by, um, it follows a health risk assessment where risks are identified and they are assessed and the controls for those risks are assessed. And the hierarchy of controls, it always kind of starts with elimination and substitution, which would be the most effective controls um, that can be in place. But um, the least effective uh, going down would be administrative controls and PPE. Uh, 
Okay, so the hierarchy of, of controls reduce or eliminate the exposure of the hazard, and in this case being the COVID-19 hazard to the worker. And the key principle within workplace is that no one control is foolproof. Ideally, a combination of strategies, starting with the most effective, the top strategies being elimination, substitution, where those can't occur, engineering controls, and then followed by administrative and PPE. The administrative and PPE controls require assistance and behavioral change from the worker, and so is least effective in these measures. So with, the, with regards to COVID-19, looking at engineering controls, we can look at increasing ventilation, as well as possibly using screens or barriers to separate people from each other where social distancing is, um, is very difficult to do so. With regards to administ uh, administrative controls, as my colleague previously spoke, a workplace plan of action is actually essential to be developed by each workplace. And here, we need to develop contingency and business continuity plan for if there's an outbreak in the community or in the workplace. Basically, we need to, in this document, we need to prepare our organizations for the possibility of an outbreak of COVID-19 within the workplace. And businesses need to think about how do we keep our business running, even if significant numbers of workers or maybe contractors or suppliers cannot come to our sites. And this plan needs to be, there needs to be engagement with the workers and their representatives, as well as the contractors about what the company's plan is. There needs to be, as Mpumi spoke earlier, an emphasis on the importance of staying away from work, even if there's only mild symptoms that is experienced by the worker. And within the plan, we need to address sick leave arrangements. Um, and also, we need to take into account the mental health as well as the social consequences of a case of COVID-19 being present in the workplace. And for small and medium-sized businesses that don't have in-house occupational health support, there needs to be consultation with the public health and labor authorities in advance of an emergency so that guidance is sought and so that we already have a plan of action before uh, a case comes to at our workplace. And as my colleague said, where feasible, we need to promote teleworking. I know it's not always feasible, particularly within the construction industry, but where it is, is feasible, we need to promote this and allow workers to work flexible hours to minimize overcrowding or crowding within the workplace. The other administrative controls that we need to look at is that we need to have clear infection prevention and controls plan, we need to revise these, we need to revise the standard precautions that we take. We need to review and revise our occupational health policies to ensure that we're covering this additional risk within the workplace. We need to think about controlling the access to our workplace uh, by looking at screening procedures that can be done. We need to look at proper signage that needs to be put up some examples of signage that is important to communicate to visitors as well as contractors as well as staff is that we need to encourage people to stay at home when they're sick we need to have posters or signage about cough and sneeze etiquette as well as hand hygiene and with regards to reviewing our cleaning and our disinfection procedures in the workplace, this also needs to be a priority. We need to ensure that there's safe waste management, management practices and procedures that are in place. And there needs to be an establishment of contact points between the organization, uh, as occupational health or infection control people, as well as the local health authorities. And uh, we need to also establish the appropriate public health reporting procedures. Uh, and we need to foster all the policies and the procedures that are in place need to be there to foster a blame-free working environment so that workers know that they can report when they're sick 
and there won't be penalization. Uh, we also, we know that there's mental health risks because of COVID-19 and people's exposure to COVID-19 during this time. And employees need to be able to access employee assistance programs uh, to ensure mental health supports. And we need to have appropriate and updated travel policies as the bans are uh, lifted to ensure that there's safety of staff. My colleague Mpumi spoke to the importance of educating and inform, informing our employees and giving people, our workers, facts about what is this disease, how is it transmitted, and what controls have been put in place to protect them. Um, they need to have information about infection prevention and controls, including the hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene practices. Where um, PPE is being used, they need to be aware of what the correct donning and doffing, as well as the disposal of PPE uh, within the workplace. Workers also need to be advised on self-assessment. So they need to know what symptoms um, are, are likely within COVID-19 disease and be able to assess themselves and report and know the reporting structures in place should they have any symptoms and what sick leave policies would then be applied to them should they either be exposed or sick from COVID-19. Workers should also be uh, encouraged to take the influenza vaccine where it's possible. I know there are shortages of this vaccine, but because of the similar uh, symptoms with influenza, uh, it would be good to re reduce the number of influenza cases within the, within the workplace. There should also be communication about the policies of sick leave, and the travel risks should travel need to be um, followed through. In terms of, my colleague already spoke to vulnerable populations and we need to protect the people in our workplaces who are, who are at increased risk. And these are some of the, 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 the risk factors for poor outcomes um, for COVID-19 disease. And they were mentioned earlier by my colleague. And it's important that uh, we, these people who would need to possibly be assessed by a medical practitioner, uh, where there's doubt whether or not they can come into the workplace. Um, and based on ideally the occupational medicine practitioner's advice, when they need to be accommodated, they may need to work from home or they may need to have a safer role, an on-site role uh, that en enables them to be socially distanced from other people. But each individual case should be done on a case-by-case -case merit because not all people with cardiovascular disease may be immunocompromised. It depends on the severity as well as the control of the disease. Social distancing within the workplace is an important, um, it's important factor to now put into the, this workplace to protect us against COVID-19. And workplaces should have a policy for social distancing with the, in the workplaces. Employees should be trained on how to socially distance within the workplace. There needs to be a plan for the minimum number of people to be on site in order for the site to operate safely and effectively. And we need to arrange the workplace to ensure that there's minimal contact between employees. And with each employee, we need to have reduced the number of contact between each employee. By one of the examples that has been used is that a fixed teams or partnering should be used where employees can't work alone. Where employees need to be working in groups Fixed teams are preferable, as my colleague mentioned earlier, for contact tracing, should there be an infection within the workplace, um, this would be able to be monitored effectively. Social distancing, we mustn't forget the common areas. 
um, like the entrances and exits of the site. We need to also within the canteens, the break rooms, the lavatories, as my colleague mentioned. And these, we can get around um, decongesting these rooms by staggering break times to avoid the concentration of workers in these common areas. We can also look at changing shift patterns or staggering break times and start times to decrease the number of people at entrances and exits as well. It's also important to consider people's travel to work uh, because this could also put them at increased risk and that risk could be brought into our workplaces. So the ideal situation is wherever is possible, workers should travel to the site alone using their own transport. But as we know, this is oftentimes not practical. But if workers have no option but to share transport, the journey should be shared ideally with the same individual and with a minimum number of people at one time. When driving, there should be good ventilation. And ideally, the workers should be facing away from each other to, to reduce the risk of transmission. So we should avoid sitting face to face. The vehicles, vehicles also need to be cleaned regularly using gloves and standard cleaning uh, products uh, with an emphasis on the handles and the areas where passengers may touch the surfaces that passengers may touch. It's also important for the sites then to consider parking arrangements for additional vehicles, possibly even bicycles, and even if there's other means of transport, one example is a bicycle, to avoid public transport. And at the entrance and exits, we should be providing hand cleaning facilities so that when people enter the work site, they enter with clean hands. Where public transport is the only option for workers, uh, considerations about changing or staggering uh, hours to reduce congestion on public transport and avoiding public transport during the peak times are some considerations. Now we know that even within the site and there's, or within the day's duties, employees can have work-related travel. And it's important to have policies, have plans, have SOPs in place to minimize the person-to-person -person contact during either deliveries to other sites. And if it's essential that two people, a two-person delivery is essential, then we need to maintain consistent pairing. It's also important to think about payments and documents exchange during deliveries. And if there are ways to ensure that this is done electronically, um, the risk of transmission can be reduced. We need to ensure that hand sanitizers are available for the drivers and for people who need to travel. And we need to clean the vehicles regularly. We need to revise the pickup and the drop off collection points, the procedures, the signage, as well as the markings to assist us. As my colleague alluded to this earlier, hand washing and toilet facilities are essential to, to just think about how these work within our workplaces so that they don't become a site of um, transmission. Employees ideally should be allowed to have regular breaks to wash their hands. And we need to think about providing additional hand washing facilities to the usual facilities on a large site that is spread out uh, so that we can reduce the number of, of personnel that use uh, only a few facilities. We need to ensure there's adequate supply of soap and fresh water, and this needs to be topped up regularly. We need to provide hand sanitizers uh, where hand washing facilities are not available. We need to even think about the restriction, restricting the number of people using a toilet facility at any one time. We could even do this using an attendant there. 
or proper signage or floor markings to ensure that a distance of 1 to 1.5 to 2 meters is maintained between people when they're queuing for the toilet facilities. It should be encouraged that workers wash or sanitize their hands before and after using the toilet facilities. And um, we need to clean the hand washing facilities as well and ensure that there's a regular cleaning regime for toilet facilities, particularly the points that are frequently touched, like the door handles, the locks, and the toilet flush. Ideally, portable toilets should be avoided where it's possible, but where this is the only option, these should be cleaned more regularly and emptied more frequently. There should also be provision of suitable and sufficient rubbish bins for the disposable hand towels within the toilet facilities. We also need to think about the site access points. And ideally, we should stop all non-essential visitors from, from entering our work sites. We need to consider staggered start and finish times, as we said before, to reduce the congestion. We need to plan the site access points to enable social distancing. Uh, we may need to change the number of, of access points and also um, we need to allow plenty of space between people waiting. If you see the picture uh, on the corner, here there is, um, there's markings to allow for a distance of at least 1.5 between workers. So these are, these are some examples that can be used within work sites. We also need to screen visitors and workers for symptoms of COVID-19 on arrival to work. So workers need to know what the symptoms are and they need to uh, be screened for these symptoms and follow guidelines as to what should happen within a workplace when people do have symptoms. We need to remove or disable entry systems that require skin contact, like if there's any fingerprint scanners. And we need to re we need to require all workers ideally to wash their hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before entering and before leaving the site. And as we said before, cleaning is essential for contact surfaces, either reception offices, access control panels, uh, delivery areas, turnstiles, um, telephone handsets, desks, etc. And where offloading and onloading arrangements on site will allow it, the drivers should remain in their vehicles. And if they need to e exit their vehicles, they should wash and sanitize their hands before handling any materials. And consideration about arranging monitoring com um, for compliance should also be thought about. On site, it's important to reduce movements by discouraging non-essential trips within the buildings or within sites. Where it's possible and safe, telephones should be used to communicate and then they need to be cleaned effectively. We need to reduce job rotation and equipment rotation. So some of the ways to, to conquer this problem would be for a worker to do a single task for the day. Um, and thereafter, the uh, equipment cleaned and sterilized. Even with regards to the walkways around the workplace, there should be one-way systems. And we, sh we should use signage uh, and ground markings to allow for control flows of, of people within the work sites. As we said before, we need to reduce the op occupancy of vehicles we need to separate the sites ideally into working zones so that we can keep different groups of workers physically separated as much from one another. We need to reduce the number of people in attendance at the site inductions and consider holding them outdoors wherever it's possible for social distancing. 
We need to regulate the use of high traffic areas that could be the corridors, the lifts, the turnstiles, the walkways to ensure social distancing. And we need to change the layout of the site to allow people to work further apart from each other. And where it's not possible, arrangements should be made that, that workers should work side by side or facing away from each other rather to fa than face to face. And where possible, screens can be used to separate people from each other. And also it's important to remember that consistent pairing systems um, and consistent use of, if groups are, are required consistent, there needs to be consistency in who is put together. With regards to meetings, ideally we need to use other methods to avoid face-to-face -face contact. And meetings should only be held where absolutely necessary. In these meetings, we should avoid sharing pens and other objects. Hand sanitizer should be, should be um, provided. And meetings, if they can be held outdoors or need to be held in well-ventilated rooms. And we can use signage to ensure that there's a distance. If you can see the picture, there's a group of workers having a meeting. There's signage to show where each person must stand to ensure that social distancing is maintained. Within the canteens and rest areas, this is a site for, for quite, for possible transmission of the virus. And workers ideally should be encouraged to bring their own food and, and ideally to stay on site once they've entered it. And where there is no alternatives and a canteen services provided, takeaway services should be used and the food pre-prepared and wrapped. Uh, we should also consider increasing the number and the size of these canteen facilities on site. Uh, and, and the capacity of each canteen or rest area should be clearly identified. Break time should be staggered to reduce the congestion. And these should be frequently cleaned, particularly the highly touched areas. Hand cleaning facilities and sanitizers should be available and all the rubbish should be put straight into the bin and not left for someone else to clear up. The crockery, the eating utensils, cups, and those things need to either be disposable or to be washed and dried between use. And payments, uh, like a, con a, a contactless card system should be employed to prevent spread. Canteen staff also needs to be encouraged to wash their hands often and with soap and water for at least 20 minutes before and after handling food. And maybe thinking about monitoring compliance within these areas may be essential. Um, we can also use additional safe outdoor space for breaks and reconfigure seating and tables to ensure um, space, social distancing is maintained and reduce face-to-face -face interactions. With regards to cleaning and disinfection, we spoke about it already. We need to enhance our procedures across sites and particularly in communal areas at, touch, at high touch points. Also, we need to think about cleaning and disinfecting machinery and equipment controls, as well as telephone equipment, keyboards, photocopiers, and other office equipment. Rubbish collection and storage points should be increased. It needs, rubbish needs to be regularly emptied throughout the day. With regards to personal protective equipment, it's important to remember that PPE is an effective measure only within a complete package of mitigation and control strategies. So this should never be used alone. And the appropriate PPE should be informed by the risk assessment. And we mustn't forget the safety helmets, gloves, eye protection, high visibility clothing, all that may be appropriate and this should be informed by the risk assessment. We need to ensure where PPE is appropriate that it should be available and N95s we need to look at what job descriptions are if there are first aiders that may need to assist during first aid procedures 
there may be a place for N95s, but this should be informed by the risk assessment alone. Um, PPE that is used and contaminated need to be discarded within, with accordance to safe practice, practices, and surgical masks should be available for workers who come in with respiratory symptoms. Uh, the PPE should be used by one person alone and ideally not shared. And we also need to think about the regulations of the country with regards to cloth masks, um, which I don't put down as a form of PPE, but when using cloth masks, you need to wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water before putting it on as, as well as after removing it. You need to avoid touching your face or the cloth mask as you can contaminate the mask yourself. You need to wash hands regularly. The mask should cover the nose and the mouth completely and shouldn't be lowered when sneezing or when coughing uh, or when speaking as this then defeats the purpose of containing the respiratory droplets. Ideally, they should be changed, washed and ironed um, daily and they should be washed in line with the manufacturer's instructions. And this, when you're wearing a cloth mask, you're not completely safe, so you need to, you need to still practice social distancing and all the other control measures to ensure that you have safety within the workplace. My colleague alluded to this earlier, that there's ongoing mental health, during, mental health risk during this time of COVID-19. And some of it is because of increased demands at home, which may be due to caring responsibilities. There may be concerns about finances, of job security during this prolonged lockdown period. There may be changing workloads and work locations. There could be even issues of bereavement and anxiety related to the fear of actually contracting COVID-19 itself. So ideally, even in workplaces, we need to think about putting systems in place to support and maintain as well as prevent um, mental health, poor mental health outcomes. Because mental health is closely linked with the, wealth, the workforce well-being as well as organizational resilience and productivity. And so things like employee assistance programs need to be thought about within our workplaces. So with regards to um, workers who may be exposed within the workplace, my colleague had a, had a nice slide a little bit earlier that spoke to the sources of COVID infection within a workplace, that people could get COVID from the community and bring this into the workplace, or there may be processes within the workplace that actually may put people at risk of getting COVID-19. So when workers are exposed within the workplace, it's important that a workplace investigation is done to ensure and to rate the exposure level. High exposure level is when there has been close contact that is within one meter uh, of a COVID infected individual. And this close contact has been prolonged, that is for greater than 15 minutes. And the person who has been exposed was not wearing PPE, or if they were wearing PPE, there was a failure of their PPE. Maybe they had PPE on, but it was on their chin instead of on their mouth and nose. Or they had direct contact with the respiratory droplets of a, of a person who has been exposed. Or even workers who are living with a confirmed case. Now it's essential when we have some, this kind of situation that a workplace investigation is done to assess the level of exposure. If it has been confirmed as high risk, these workers need to self-quarantine out of the workplace for a minimum of 14 days. If it's possible, these employees can work from home. We also need to ensure that they have the mental health support that they need. 
And the investigation that is done within the workplace would allow, allow us to see who, do they, uh, who were they in contact with in the workplace. And this is why it's essential to keep people working in small groups so that should this be an issue, we can immediately identify who uh, was a contact for a COVID positive person. It would also, the workplace investigation will allow us to find out where, what, what were the movements of this person um, when the infection started so that appropriate cleaning uh, can be initiated around these areas. We need to ensure that appropriate reporting is done to the necessary departments. And while the workers are away from work uh, for the self-quarantine for 14 days, they need to be self-monitor for symptoms as well as for fever. If there are no symptoms that these, that these employees experience uh, during their time in self-quarantine, they can come back to the workplace on day 15. However, if at any time this exposed worker develops symptoms while they are self-quarantined, they should be referred for testing. So we spoke of cases where there's exposure and it's a high risk exposure. But what happens when a worker is exposed, but it's low risk? Now, low risk exposure is if a worker is exposed to a COVID positive person, but they are more than a meter away from this COVID, this confirmed case. And the contact is for less than 15 minutes or even if they were within one week, one meter of the infected person, they were wearing the appropriate PPE. Um, and if the COVID-19 infected person was wearing a surgical mask, this also puts the risk at a lower level. So a workplace investigation needs to be done to assess was the risk of exposure high or low? If it was low and it was confirmed to be low, the person can come to the workplace but would need to self-monitor uh, for symptoms. Should the person become symptomatic at any time during these 14 days with a self-monitoring, they need to be referred for testing. Now this slide talks to the steps to follow if the, a worker has been diagnosed with COVID-19 in the workplace. So when a worker has a confirmed positive COVID-19 test, it's important that the reporting is done within uh, South Africa. We need, to, it's a notifiable disease. It needs to be reported to the Department of Health, and if it is also an occupationally acquired disease, then it would need to be reported to the Department of Employment and Labor and the Compensation Commissioner. So when we have a known uh, COVID-19 positive case within our workplace, it's important that this worker is isolated from all other employees. They need to be provided with a surgical mask that helps to contain the respiratory droplets. And we need to isolate the person and ensure that the person is treated uh, and out of the workplace. The, it's also important, like we said earlier, to ensure that there's mental health support. And this person should also have the appropriate sick leave issued to them. At the workplace, when there's a COVID-19 positive patient, a workplace investigation, an incident investigation needs to be performed. So that contact tracing um, or the people that need contact tracing needs to be, um, to be done, as well as we need to ensure that there's appropriate cleaning carried out. And ideally, um, when the person recovers, 
If it's mild cases, recovery is often after about 14 days after symptoms onset, but in severe cases, this could be longer and ideally should, um, should be based on some kind of a medical advice. When the COVID-19 um, positive person comes back into the workplace, after their time of recovery, there needs to be workplace restrictions on return to work. So all employees on returning to work, either after isolation or quarantine, should have the following restrictions. Ideally, they should undergo medical evaluation to confirm that they are fit to come back to, to work. They should wear a surgical mask at all times while at work for a period of at least 21 days from the time they had that initial positive test. They need to continue with the social distancing measures within the workplace. They need to adhere to the hand hygiene, the respiratory hygiene, and the cough etiquette. And they need to continue to self-monitor for symptoms. And should they reoccur, they need to uh, seek medical reevaluation. So it can't be stressed again uh, that minimizing the risk of transmission in the workplace is essential. And we need to, communication and awareness is important with regards to toolbox talks. We need to review our health risk assessments and review our hierarchy of controls. We need to minimize the risks within our workplaces by ensuring their social distancing, promoting regular and thorough hand washing of everybody who comes to our sites and to our buildings. We need to practice good respiratory hygiene, avoid touching our face, especially while we're working, and clean frequently handled surfaces within our sites, and advise workers on self-assessment, symptom reporting, and sick leave policy screen, and identify potentially affected employees so that there are limited contact and movement from these people and, and referral for appropriate testing promptly when needs be. We need to encourage and even insist upon that symptomatic people stay away from the workplace. And we should ideally have occupational health input to manage the program internally. These are some references and thank you so much for your attention and your time. Thank you very much for that, Odette. Um, and I must say that my colleague has performed excellent today on our construction webinar. <laughs> I got a salute back from her. So our next um, a reminder for colleagues, please, um, if I could just adjust this camera. Um, technically, sometimes our camera readjusts itself and we just need to manually um, sort this out. So if you just give me a moment. Also, just to make sure that you please type your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, so that our presenters can actually respond to you. So that last presenter was our um, colleague from the occupational medicine section, and she has uh, dealt with the question of uh, the return to work procedures and workplace preparedness uh, around the policies and screening for your section as the construction section. Our next um, uh, presenter is from the Department of Employment and Labor. Uh, the presenter is Mr. Hilton Ganeshan, and he's kindly uh, approved, uh, uh, agreed with his colleagues to deal with the construction section guidelines for COVID-19. I welcome Hilton. Thank you very much. Do not forget, please type your questions in the Q&A section. Thank you for the introduction. I'm just going to adjust my mask so you guys can hear me clearly. I'm Yilton Ganesan from the Department of Labor. I'm the Deputy Director for Construction. I'm the National Construction Specialist, and I'm going to touch on the construction regulations 
together with the proposed construction sector guidelines. And I'm going to try and cover a lot of questions that's unanswered by many of uh, your guys. I'll, I'm sitting on the, the panel as well. I could see there's 800 some odd uh, participants and uh, many questions were coming in. So hopefully my uh, slide will try to address this, uh, these questions. As you can see, I'm trying to adjust my mask because uh, I see there's a lot of uh, questions that's coming in that uh, uh, I'm not very clear. So I hope I, hope I am clear now. Uh, uh, my, my contents, the introduction, I'm gonna cover a basic introduction, the COVID-19 compliance in the construction sector, uh, construction notification permits, which is a very common question coming into the Department of Labor, then eye contact activities on the construction site, and then uh, complaints deviations which contact directly in the Department of Labor. The Disaster Management Act through Section 27.2, we, we released uh, the Department of uh, Disaster Management uh, through uh, the Corporate Government Department, they released two disaster management regulations. Uh, the first one was on level four on the 29th of uh, April 2020, and then the second one was on the 28th of May, that was on level three. Now, I just want to iterate on these regulations. Right? Okay, just in the bottom of the slide, you can see we are aware of the ICOT ruling. And currently, as we said, uh, these regulations are still applicable. Obviously, if it's not, then we'll deal with it adequately at that time. So for today, again, it is applicable. So regulation two of the 28, on the 28th of uh, May, that, that regulation, it says that these regulations are in addition of chapter four after chapter three. So at the Department of Labor, we get a lot of uh, questions coming in. So what happens to the previous uh, disaster management regulation? So this is to answer your question. If you check or read regulation two, it, it iterates that it is in addition of the previous regulation. So it's not in isolation. You read the both regulations together and as it is indicated, it's in addition to uh, chapter, uh, the addition of chapter four after chapter three. So if we compare the, the both regulations, the level four alert and alert level three, there were some minor deviations and regulations to code. So um, I referenced them in the first column, compliance employee. Now, a lot of uh, people do not make reference to this designation. Now, if you read the April 2020 alert level four, under regulation 5.4, it clearly indicates that a employer should designate an, a compliance employee. Now, it, it's read in the context where that this compliance employee is mainly for a supermarket or retail, but I'll cover that later on and how it is applicable in the construction industry as well. And then after that appointment, the common one is the compliance officer. Now the compliance officer in the first regulation, the one promulgated in April 2020, the reference there was under regulation 166A. And then there was reference to a work plan and how you implement the work plan by phasing in uh, employees from other provinces and stuff that's all directed into the work plan and out protocols as well. So all are under 16.6 making reference to the work plan. Now the alert level three regulation, it's under regulation 47.1a. Now you'll note that it doesn't make reference to a compliance employee as the previous regulation, which does not mean that the compliance employee is no longer required. So I'm gonna cover a bit of these later on uh, in detail. Now the OHS directive that most of you guys know that was promulgated or released through our department, the Department of Employment and Labor, this reference, it came out from chapter two of the disaster management regulation, whereby authority to issue directions. 
So this is a very common question as well. Where does our directive come from? Where it fits in into the disaster management regulation and so forth. So if you read regulation 14.4, it indicates directly all directions issued in terms of these regulations shall continue to apply unless varied, amended, or withdrawn by the cabinet member responsible for such directions. So, which means that although our directive, another common question, which was released through the April 2020 disaster management regulation, whether it's applicable under alert level three, and then this is your answer, look at regulation 14.4, it says that it will continue to be applicable until it's withdrawn or amended. So our OHS directive, which reference C19, COVID-19 OHS directive, it comes in with the, uh, added requirements as well. So if you look at the OHS directive, it requires employers to do a risk assessment, the health and safety policy, appoint a manager. I just added the COVID-19 there because in the construction industry, I don't want any confusion between the construction health and safety manager or construction manager, the 8-1. So that's just my uh, highlighting the COVID-19 manager, but in the directive, we indicate a manager. And uh, the OHS directive indicates that there'll be sector guidelines released. Now, most of you guys know that I'm responsible for the construction sector guidelines, which is in the draft stage currently waiting promulgation. So the OHS directive also indicates that uh, your risk assessment is not applicable for employees who've got less than 10 employees. You, if you are that employer, then you have to adhere to clause 40 of the OHS directive. And the risk assessment and the health and safety policy must be submitted to the Department of Labor if you have more than 500 employees. The sector guideline template. Now, if you're in position of the C19 OHS directive released by the Department of Employment and Labor, you'll see on the last page or the annexure, this is how we should release these sector guideline templates. So these are the six points. And the, the presenters before me, they touched quite uh, intensively on engineering controls, administrative controls, transport, uh, risk assessment, and so forth. So I'm not going to try and duplicate their presentation. As indicated, the, all of these presentations will be available to you on the website as well. So uh, whichever sector is releasing uh, these sector guidelines, these are the standard templates that we have to follow. And uh, COVID-19 being... Uh, new to, to us, there's not much documents that we can say that is promulgated. So whenever we create these sector guideline templates, we are using guidelines by the Department of Health and the NIOH and other relevant uh, bodies that's assisting with guidelines and templates to adhere to compliance with the COVID-19. So the what I try to do here is I try to just put them all in order because uh, a lot of people call us and say that it's too much. This information here, information there, and disaster management regulation, and Department of Labor and stuff. So this is in order. If you're an employee or employer, this is in order of what's required. You need to designate a compliance employee. You need to have a work plan. You need to have a compliance officer. You need to do a risk assessment. You need to do a health and safety policy. You need to appoint a manager, and then there'll be sector guidelines, which we're trying to limit the amount of uh, documents and appointments as well, just to provide guidelines to the current uh, directive and the regulations. So in the construction sector, this is a construction life cycle, and it's comprised of six stages. Yeah, so the stages are labeled or titled on the slide as well. As indicated, these presentations will be available to you guys. And uh, these six stages, they basically cover the construction life cycle from start to end. So current construction work, you're gonna slot yourself into one of these stages. New construction work, obviously, you'll know which stage you follow. And uh, previous construction that's continuing now under alert level three, you'll have to slot yourself into one of these six stages. Now, these identifications of work, it's coming from the section 20 of the Council for Built Environment Act. The Council for Built Environment, which we abbreviate as CBE, falls under the Department of Public Works. 
Now, these six councils, uh, as you can see, it's labeled there. Uh, it's, it's specific, like if you look at the SSCPCMP, it's for the project and construction management professions, and look at, like, at EXA, it's engineers and so forth. So during these six stages, at some stage, you're gonna use these professional councils to assist you in your construction work or design or whatever the case might be in health and safety and so forth. So for SSCPCMP, the construction regulations, we've got three categories approved uh, by the chief inspector, which was SSCPCMP, and uh, the three categories of registration was the professional health and safety agent, your construction health and safety manager, and your construction health and safety officer. Now, uh, this might not be the platform to indicate this, but please, if you are, I can see there's a lot of you guys on this platform, if you are a registered agent or you're a construction health and safety manager or you're a construction health and safety officer, please know your scope of services within your registration. Why I'm saying this is because a lot of construction companies or construction employees or clients want to appoint uh, registered professions on the, on the construction site. And this is what we say, the construction regulations, we approve these three categories of construct of uh, professions. So again, I want to iterate, if you are registered as one of these three uh, categories, as you can see on the screen, please know your scope of services. If you are not allowed to do stages one to three, please refrain from doing stages one to three. Uh, when you're registered at the appropriate level, uh, SSCPCMP sent you a registration guideline documents and obviously indicated to you your scope of services. And um, again, I'm iterating, please uh, work within your scope of services. So when it comes to the previous construction sites, current construction sites, and now we've got new construction sites under alert, alert level three, very common question is on construction work permits. Now, if you got a construction work permit issued to you before the lockdown, and now you're commencing with construction work again, you do not have to apply for another permit. So meaning that if the Department of Labor issued you a construction work permit, please, that permit is still applicable now, uh, currently. We are aware of the lockdown, and uh, obviously those dates that you couldn't do construction work, we take that into consideration as well. But if you are starting a new project that requires a construction work permit, then you need to apply for a construction work permit through the uh, Annexure 1 and submit the relevant documents. Just to iterate, for those that uh, are not familiar with construction work permit, there is an exemption on who should apply for a construction work permit and the threshold or the value currently is for construction work more than 60 million rand. Then the notification of construction work, which is your prescribed Annexure 2, now, again, if you submitted this prior to the lockdown or prior to your alert level that you were, you couldn't do construction work, then it is not necessary for you to resubmit your notification of construction work. As I iterated, we are aware of the lockdown, we are aware of the downtime, and we take that into consideration. But please, if you're starting a new construction uh, site, you need to submit the relevant annexure two, or if it's a permit, then you need to apply for the construction work permit. So, as I indicated initially, there are some appointments that's required, and uh, I'm just going to touch on them individually and uh, provide some answers and guidelines to most of the common questions that came into our department and other stakeholders. Now, as you can see, the compliance employee, this is uh, referenced under Regulation 5.4 of the April or Alert Level 4 disaster management regulation. It says every business premises, including but not limited to a supermarket, grocery store, retail store, wholesale uh, produce market, or pharmacy, and it goes on. Now, uh, I know that this is most likely not applicable to a construction site, but being in the, in the construction industry, it has many variables. Uh, the construction industry is unlike a fixed industry where we can say it's, these are the rules. Now, why I'm saying this, because some stores or some malls or there's some estates that still allow customers to come in on the construction site. So this compliance employee under Regulation 5.4, that was the intention of the legislator 
to ensure that customers or people coming out into a business site or business premises that they are covered or the COVID-19 is taken into consideration. So as I iterated before or previously, construction site, many variables are attached to a site. So the, we, are, we do have sites where customers go into a construction site, like for estates and stuff. So depending on your risk assessment, you have to identify whether you will need a compliance employee. Then after that appointment, we have a compliance officer. Now this is under the disaster management regulation as well. Now a, the compliance officer, his main duty is to deal with the work plan. Now the work plan is stipulated uh, on this regulation as well under B. A lot of questions coming in even this morning I'm seeing on our screens as well on competency of these uh, appointees, which I'll touch later on as well. So. These are the, the mandatory requirements that you have to comply with by appointing a compliance officer to ensure that the work plan is done, especially for the return of employees coming back to work. Now, the work plan is a prescribed form, which I will cover later on as well. My pointer seems to cease. Okay, this is the work plan, thank you. This is the work plan, it's prescribed under Annex E of the April 2020 Disaster Management Regulation, which was level four. Now this is coming under Regulation 16.6b. Now the work plan, please adhere to the Annex as much as we, uh, we want uh, to cover 100% or if not more, this is a minimum requirement, these six points under your Annex E. So anything above this is highly favorable or highly uh, favored as well. So what, what I'm gonna just iterate here is, it it's specifies, like if you look under five, it talks about screening, under six about attendance record system, infrastructure, work area, employees and stuff. So if you are creating a work plan, amplify these sections and then use the references that I made reference to before. We've got health guidelines, we've got many uh, documents that can assist us to ensure that this work plan is adhered. Now, if you look at G, under 5G in the work plan, we say, uh, testing facilities for establishment more than 500 employees. Now, a common question that comes into the Department of Labor is how did we establish for our OHS director to 500? So this is where we use the 500. It, it actually came from the disaster management regulation. We benchmarked that when we did the OHS director. So this is from the OHS director, now uh, clause 16. It says that every employer must establish the following administrative measures. Now you have to do a risk assessment under 16.1, which I'm gonna to touch on later on as well. And then it says that if the employer, this is 16.2 plus 16.2 of the OHS director, it says if the employer employs more than 500 employees, the employer must submit a record of its risk assessment and written policy now to your health and safety committee and to the Department of Labor. Now the Department of Labor, this provincial chief inspectors that you need to submit these documents to. And uh, if you've got more than 500, you should have a health and safety committee established and you should give them a copy of these, the risk assessment and your health and safety policy. Now, the big question is how do you slot this in in the construction site? Now, all construction sites have to start off with a client. Now what we are saying is, remember the sector guidelines, it's not out, so I want you to iterate that back. So this will be cleared out on the sector guidelines. But for now, as I'm advising, I'm giving you a, a guideline, the client must amend or add an addendum to the baseline risk assessment and the client's site-specific health and safety plan to incorporate these requirements throughout the site. Meaning that if you already got an existing site, add an, an addendum to your, to your specs and to your baseline risk assessment to incorporate the requirements of COVID-19. If you're commencing with a new site, then incorporate these requirements 
into your baseline risk assessment and your such specific other safety specifications. Now, on the construction side, if you comply with these, or if the client complies with this, then obviously it's going to go through throughout the site, through, through the principal contractor, through the clients, and so forth. So when I say it's cascaded to the principal contractors, obviously you guys know that a principal contractor must do an also safety plan, and this plan must be approved by the client. So if the client makes it a requirement on his and then in his baseline risk assessment and uh, his uh, client's health and safety specifications to incorporate COVID-19 requirements, the principal contractor will have to adhere with that in his plan and obviously the client must approve the plan as well. And then the, the same system goes on for a contractor as per the PC requirements above. Another common question, which I know that's coming in throughout uh, the provinces as well on the construction regulations is employer. Now remember, on the construction side, the client can be the employer, the PC can be the employer, the contractors can be the employer, and I indicated otherwise agreed upon. Now, uh, those of you guys who are familiar with the OSHAC, we have uh, section 41, which indicates that the OSHAC allows for two agreements. It's your section 37-2 agreement, and section 10.4. Section 10.4 talks about managing man, uh, designers, manufacturers, and stuff. For the purpose of today, section 37 talks about an agreement between parties. Now, on a typical construction side, the PC is usually the employer. Why? Because the client and the PC will sign a section 37.2 agreement where the PC adheres to comply with all health and safety on the site. And obviously, whoever comes to the site will adhere to the PC's requirements. So there's a many variables attached to this scenario. Sometimes on, on a site, a client will appoint, uh, I did come across a site where a client appointed 22 PCs on one site and refrained from allowing PCs to appoint contractors. And then there's also a site where a client will do the work for himself. So it's not something that we can legislate, it's, it's variables and I want to iterate as well, a section 37.2 agreement is not compulsory. We do come across some sites where there's no section 37.2 agreement and the client has his own employees on site, PC has his own employees on site, so they are individually categorized as employees. So depending on the contract, depending on the, on how the construction site is uh, contracted, these variables can be unpacked and the employer can be determined. But as I indicated, Previously, 90% of sites, the client and the PC will sign a section 37.2 agreement, which is allowed and legally recognized, and then the PC is deemed as the employer. So just for reference, on my sector guidelines, I recommended that the PC appoints a compliance officer, which I'll touch on later on. Risk assessment, I'm glad my previous speakers they covered this risk assessment. So I'm not gonna go very much detail into it. I've seen they covered the hierarchy of controls and stuff. So what I'm gonna iterate is, on a construction side, when we mention COVID-19 risk assessment, we're not talking baseline risk assessment per se, and we're not talking your construction regulation risk assessment, CR9. This risk assessment is specifically addressed to COVID-19, and it's your hazardous biological agents risk assessment, which means abbreviation, HPA risk assessment. So please, I want to iterate, you're gonna have your HPA risk assessment. You're still gonna, the client is still gonna do his baseline risk assessment. Client is, uh, and the contractor is still gonna do his CR9 risk assessment. So please do not confuse these risk assessments and think that one replaces another. So the previous speaker did go into detail about how to conduct this risk assessment. And this is a, a screenshot that I put on, this, uh, on the slide. This risk assessment guideline was done by the Department of Health and the Department of Employment and Labor, which provides a very detailed and prescriptive way of how to do a risk assessment. The previous speaker also touched on this document as well. On the slide, this is just the first page of this document. It's a 12-page document on a workplace preparedness plan uh, promulgated or released by the Department of Employment and Labor on how to adhere to the previous one, your risk assessment. Now, the, uh, the previous speaker did talk about classifying employees and uh, they, they, 
grouped into low, medium, high, uh, high risk and low, uh, very high exposure risk. So uh, I'm urging you guys to please go through these documents. They are available on the NIOH website, on our website, and even on www.carb.za website as well. So these two documents will assist you tremendously on the construction side to do your risk assessment and also to touch on your work plan and screening and stuff like that on a construction side. Now on a construction side, these are the, the eye contact activities or areas that you have to be aware of. Now activities, many labor intensive activities which we cannot really uh, space out people. So this have to be really taken into consideration your labor intensive activities. And then also you get uh, on a construction site, people working below other persons. So you have to take that into consideration as well when you're doing your risk assessment. Toolbox talks, handling of tools, working in confined spaces, even working on the suspended platform. You see some suspended platform, it's small, it's got up to two to three employees on the platform. So obviously now with COVID-19, you have to take that into consideration as well. And even working on scaffolding. Now, when you're doing your risk assessment, you have to also identify the areas on the construction site that's variable as well. Remember, toilets are not fixed. The toilets will be placed at any area in the construction site, the change rooms, your shower facilities, your canteen and eating areas. Then you've also got open plan workspaces. Then you've got makeshift storage areas, workshops, and common areas within or outside the, the site. So these are the eye contact activities or areas on a construction site and which you will, you will have to do specifically as the previous uh, speakers mentioned in terms of your risk assessment, identifying eye contact areas, eye contact activities and uh, assessing employees working in these specific areas and classifying them in terms of these documents which will assist you to do the risk assessment. Now, if you look for example, site access on a construction site, now, it must be controlled. Your entry exit at different times for employees, it's recommended. Then you should have the designated compliance employees placed at different areas on the site as well. Then you should wash and sanitize or have these facilities available as well at your site access points. And then screening, and uh, depends on the type of screening that you're going to do as well, which is provided in detail in the previous documents which I've made reference to. So when it comes to register as well, COVID-19, there's a lot of uh, traceable contact details that's required. So we'll appreciate it if you can probably ask for residential address or a second telephone number or contact number so that we'll be able to trace or contact people that we want to get into contact with for obviously uh, medical reasons. And then another one that's uh, highly favorable is on the register is it's prepared not to share the pin. Usually when anyone enters a site, the security will give you a pin and we all will sign the register with that pin. So if you can provide other means or then let people pin in their own pens or whichever other electronic way it can be done, that is your risk that you have to assess on site. For example, another area is, or activity is your toolbox talks. So again, I'm indicating my sector guideline or the construction sector guideline is not out. It's not promulgated. So these are, these are just uh, guidelines that I'm giving to you guys that it's already in the sector guideline that you can use currently. So if you have toolbox talks, it's recommended to do these toolbox talks in limited groups. Usually on the construction site, everyone will congregate in the morning and you do the toolbox talks. So now that we have to take COVID-19 into consideration, limit the groups, ensure that the distancing and work, and work out the number of person to attend them in groups. And usually on a construction site, it's an open space or oh, very rarely you get a well-ventilated area. So you have to take into consideration where you do your two box talks and how you space out the employees. 
So also include a COVID-19 health and safety component in your toolbox talks, which should make reference to sanitizing equipment. Uh, your storeroom register should be controlled by one designated person, usually on a construction site, Storeroom is left open, or you, you've got your stacking and storage supervisor who will control. So we just want the COVID-19 uh, considerations to take into place by controlling the register, controlling your stationery, controlling your equipment, sanitize your equipment, and so forth. So this list, I've just gave these two examples. It, it the only uh, Sorry, I just got a technical issue. So the, the only advice and the rec highly recommended way going forward is your risk assessment. You will have to ensure that your environment or your assets and risks is addressed specifically to your site. Uh, just, sorry, sorry, I just uh, think we've got a technical issue. I'll be fine. It may be that we are having a bandwidth issue, but we solve that now. Yes, we get to go. So, uh, complaints deviations. Now, the, throughout the nine provinces, each province got a provincial chief inspector and an overture specialist. So, I know Department of Labor, we're inundated with a lot of complaints and a lot of other sub-departments, like your UIA and compensation and stuff. So, especially to address construction issues, these other contact persons are made it much more easier by giving their cell phone numbers and their email addresses. So the provincial chief inspector, as indicated by their title, they are responsible for health and safety in the province. So each province does have one provincial chief inspector and Reporting to these chief inspectors, each province will have an OHS specialist. So I gave you each of them their cell phone numbers and their email addresses, and they can obviously uh, address your complaint or any deviations that you want to report to the Department of Labor, and uh, you should get prompt response uh, by either one of these two officials. So that's my presentation from the Department of Labor touching the construction sector in terms of COVID-19. And uh, as we could see, or I was sitting in the audience before I come in, a lot of questions came in with respect to the construction sector guidelines. So what the Department of uh, Employment and Labor we're currently doing is we're amending that C-19 OHS directive. There are some areas that we have to amend on that document. So those construction sector guidelines and other sector guidelines can only be promulgated after the amended or the revised uh, OHS directive is promulgated. So thank you guys. And uh, this presentation will be available to all of you guys on the NMI OHS website. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to Newton Gunnison, the uh, Department of Employment and Labor's uh, 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 representative. And if I can just get that correct, Deputy Director for Construction Specialist. Yeah. So we've had the National Construction Specialist on our session today, and just say thank you very much to him and the um, uh, Department of Employment and Labor. Now we have, if my watch uh, shows correctly, we have reached almost uh, the end of our session time. We have about a few minutes left. So it seems that we may not be able to secure a full question answer session panel now. We have encouraged all of our colleagues at the National Institute for Occupational Health to answer your questions in the Q&A section as the live, uh, as the session was ongoing. And I think more than half of the questions were dealt with in the answered column of the Q&A. For those questions that we've not yet managed to cover during the session, and we won't be able to cover now because we just have too little time uh, to deal with it today, we will undertake and ask uh, Hilton to also assist us in looking, and he's, he's nodding and confirming, to look at those questions that we haven't managed to do, not the questions to do with 
you know, um, am I registered with the SSCCMP or not? Um, we've directed you to uh, their communications person and any other sort of administrative questions. You will be receiving a certificate for the session for those who ask the question. Um, and all presentations, as well as a video and audio recording of the session, with all the other COVID-19 resources you'll find on our zero-rated website, please do go there. And occasionally we um, place uh, useful resources, short clip videos on our Twitter account as well. And that details is also on our website. So um, I want to, at this point in time, thank um, all of our panelists. And uh, from the introductory remarks of Dr. Tanusha Singh, who's the head of our COVID-19 uh, um, outbreak response team here at the NIH, as well as play a leading role uh, with uh, Jeanette Mangani with regard to our COVID online Zoom training sessions. The, our uh, uh, representative from the SACCMP um, who introduced the session for us today, we say thank you very much to her, Ms. Van der Beek, on behalf of the registrar of the SACCMP, and we want to thank all those organizations. Uh, I think it's SAFSIC, the uh, gentleman Kubis there, as well as the um, people from the um, Master Builders Association and other organizations who helped to distribute the invite to register for this particular session. And our panelists, Dr. Mpumindaba, uh, who's from the Occupational Medicine section of the NIH, as well as Dr. Odette Valming, uh, Occupational Medicine section of the NIH, and then again, finally, uh, Hilton Ganesan from the Department of Preliminary Labor. Thank you very much for your contributions. So if you have any um, final queries, we can leave the uh, uh, chat box at the bottom open for just a minute or two more. Um, please add any final questions you have there. For those who missed the opportunity to type in your comments or questions or queries in the chat box, uh, or any questions in the Q&A box at the bottom, please, you can email us at info at nih.ac.za. That is I-N-F-O, info at nioh.ac.za. But I must encourage you, please visit the website because you'll find all of our frequently asked questions, the resources, the guidelines, uh, the risk, bio-risk assessment and risk assessment steps, practical forms and templates there, as well as all the recordings of our previous webinars um, both in video and audio, and all the presentations that were linked to those webinars, you'll find on our website. That is www.nioh.ac.za. www.nioh.ac.za. And that brings me within a few seconds of one o'clock. On behalf of the National Institute for Occupational Health, a, a specialized division of the National Health Laboratory Service and sister institute to the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. We say thank you to our presenters and our guest presenter from the Department of Employment and Labor and encourage you to go and view the resources that's available on our zero rated website and that is www.nih.ac.za. And at this point, I want to thank all of those in the background. You don't see my colleague Glenn and Sampiwe and Tabani, who does all the IT aspects, and all of the other colleagues who've done quite a lot to make sure that this uh, webinar comes to you free of charge via the National Institute for Occupational Health. We thank you and we say goodbye.